An occupancy classification must be assigned to every building or space within a building. Determining the occupancy classification is one of the most important steps in the code process. It should be the first thing determined when designing the interior of a building since virtually every interior code and regulation is based on the building's occupancy. Many examples are listed in this table. The occupancy of a space must also be known in order to effectively use most of the remaining sections of this course. Once the occupancy is known, it will guide the remaining code research. For some buildings, the occupancy classification may have already been determined, but for a new or existing building that is intended to have different types of tenants, the occupancy classification for each tenant must be determined separately. These different tenants may in turn affect the way the shared public spaces are classified. In existing buildings, determining the occupancy classifications may be particularly important if the intended use of the building is changing significantly, such as an old warehouse building being renovated into apartments. The occupancy classification needs to be re-examined whenever changes are made in the use of a building or space. Some of these changes are obvious, such as a change in building type. Other changes may be less noticeable but still require reclassification. It may also be important to understand how the occupants will actually be using the space or plan to use it in the future. For example, if a space will be used for an open office plan now but in the future will be used as a conference room for training, both assembly and business requirements may need to be considered so that the design will address the most stringent code requirements. The ICC codes and the NFPA codes divide the occupancy classifications slightly different. However, the 10 most common occupancy classifications used throughout the various building and life safety codes are here. Some of them also have subclassifications. The occupancy classifications and their subcategories will be discussed in the first part of this course. Many of these classifications seem self-explanatory, especially if a building type is straightforward. But remember that three things must be known before the occupancy classification can be accurately determined. One, the type of activity occurring. Two, the expected number of occupants. And three, whether any unusual hazards or risk factors are present. These factors can affect the classification of a building type or spaces within a building. A boutique that sells clothing, for example, has an activity that is straightforward. It is a mercantile occupancy. However, in some cases, small differences in use can change the occupancy classification. For example, a television studio is a business occupancy, but if the studio allows audience viewing, it will typically be considered an assembly occupancy. Knowing the specific type or types of activities that are occurring is important. Many of the classifications allow for a specific number of people. For example, a space may appear to be an assembly use, but if a small number of people will be using the space, it may be allowed to be classified as business. When using the IBC, if a daycare center has fewer than five children, it may be considered residential, but if it has more than five, it may be considered institutional or educational. So if the number of occupants increases or decreases, the occupancy classification may need to be re-examined. Hazards to occupants can include harmful substances and or potentially harmful situations. See the document titled Risk Factors and Hazards in Occupancies by pressing on the document button below. When either is present, different types of requirements are necessary. The storage or use of flammable, explosive, or toxic materials is considered to be hazardous and can either change an occupancy to a stricter classification or require all or part of a building to be classified as a hazardous occupancy and be subject to tougher codes. Small levels of certain hazardous materials, however, are allowed in almost every occupancy classification. For example, a small amount of paint can be stored in any occupancy. However, in large amounts, it would be considered a hazardous use. Certain situations within a building or the condition of the occupants themselves can create potential risk factors or hazards as well. 
low light low levels, light levels low, awareness low awareness or mental, or mental capacity, capacity restricted, restricted movement, movement, movement security, 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 and smaller and similar characteristics, characteristics can create can potentially hazardous situations. Hazardous situations. If hazardous, if hazardous materials, materials or situations, or situations are, expected are expected to be in the building, in the building, or, space, building or space, it may affect, it may affect the appropriate, the appropriate choice, choice of occupancy, of occupancy classification. classification. Consult the local code official early in a project whenever there is uncertainty of the correct occupancy classification. It is always a good idea to have a code official confirm the choice of occupancy. If it is determined later that the choice is incorrect or is not approved by the code official, the rest of the research may be incorrect and the design may not meet the appropriate code requirements.